Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 271 for Monday, September 14th, 2020. Greetings, folks, and uh, and bless you or something, Paul. This is uh, this is Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here on the beautiful central coast of California, in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. You doing all right over there? We heard you coughing during the intro there. So, yeah, just yeah. the wrong pipe for some coffee, man. It happens. It happens. Yeah. It happens. Paul, I played a gig on Saturday night. It was um, you are an intrepid fellow, so you are you're going where no California men have gone before. Uh, at least not in a little while. That's right. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It um and and you know it was the the, the sort of. I mean, there were many layers of interesting to this gig, right? It it came up very last minute. Um, it, it it was uh, just a, a kind of a. I mean, I, I'll I'll tell you what it was called, but it was just a pickup gig of rock songs. Is is really what it was? It was a cab. They called it a cabaret because the, the people organizing it are theater people, and then they don't know to just call it a rock gig. Um, but technically, that's the right term. Is it was just a bunch of people singing different songs, and so. They said, you know, the theme is rock and roll. And so the people that wanted to sing tunes just all kind of threw songs on a list. The set list was finalized by about 1 a.m. on Saturday morning. We had a rehearsal at 11 a.m. on Saturday morning, and then we played the gig at 8 p.m. on Saturday. So it really was like a pickup gig. This this required all, you know, all of those skills that you learn as a musician, this required them. I knew everybody in the band, we'd all played together before. So like that part wasn't a, a question, but, um, but we hadn't played a gig like this together before. And, and this particular lineup had not played together before. It was essentially the band that had been doing Hedwig together. Plus um, Mike LaCoyer and uh, Mike, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your last name who I've played with before. He's a great guitar player. And so we had two guitar players, uh, Dave Comtois and Mike. Uh, Mike is like, you know, I joked. I said Dave's got everything up through nineteen like seventy five, and then and then Mike takes over and like brings nineteen seventy five screaming into the eighties and nineties. And the two of them together, I mean, it was great because they really had everything covered. And and we did. We played things from the Stones to the Beatles to, you know, the the No Doubt and you know Panic at the Disco and Queen and things like that. I mean, it was it was. It was a fun, fun gig, but, you know, came together at the last minute. So mm -hmm. um, my my biggest concern about it and I, I say biggest concern, my you, my new concern about it was my surgery. Right. Because this was, you know, 10 days after nine days after having gotten having had surgery. Amaze. It is, yeah. That's amazing. And it wasn't minor. Well, I mean, who knows what you call what anymore, but right. But I mean, you had an organ removed. I had an organ removed. Yeah, it was laparoscopic surgery, which is truly the only reason that that this was even a, a, on the radar. But and, and it is amazing. Like we were saying this pre-show every day. I am feeling like 50 percent better than the day before. I mean, it's just like remarkable how quickly uh I've been recovering and, and it's, you know, most people will recover from lapar laparoscopic surgery, which is how they did this, which means they put like a camera in and then just a couple of little instruments. And, and so it, they didn't have to slice me wide open. So, and we'll leave it at that. But, um, but I'm still under a lifting restriction. They told me for two weeks, don't lift anything that's over 20 pounds. And then some of the literature said, don't lift anything that's over 15 pounds. But, you know, in that range, it wasn't the five pound restriction, but it was this, you know, you don't want to strain your, your gut is essentially what it came down to. I was like, okay, yeah, I don't want to strain my gut. Right. I, I agree with this. So, so, um, I had my favorite, uh, drum tech in the world. My daughter, Skylar, uh, offered to be my drum tech. And, uh, and so she Skylar is not is awesome. Skylar's awesome. Yep. <laughs> she, like in, in terms of daughters that are supportive of dads and kind of feed off their dad's love, I, you know what she did for us with the Macro All Star Band and mm. how she supports you. And I mean, I know it goes both ways. I know you, totally. you know, you, your great dad, and you know, you've given her the love of music or like that. But every time I hear about that college age girl who probably has a lot of college age girls things to do at this time, you know, 
wanting to help out with our music stuff. It, I just think she's awesome. Yeah. Oh no, she was great. Everybody, everybody there loved her. She really, I mean, truly helped and everybody pitched in, in terms of like lugging gear and everything. I mean, they were like the, everyone that I was on stage with knew that, you know, I had had this and, and they were really respectful when they asked me, they're like, are you okay doing this? And I said, yeah, I'd love to, you know, I mean, every, as I keep saying on the show, every gig opportunity that I have right now could be the last one because it's getting colder and colder at night and during the day <laughs> and you know, weather can cancel an outdoor gig and I'm probably not playing too many indoor gigs. I mean, there's some places where I'd be willing to consider it, but not most, you know? And, uh, so, so the gig went, went really well, but you know, it was, I mean, so, so all of that aside, you know, COVID concerns, it was an outdoor gig that the tables, they have this stage. It's a permanent temporary, temporarily permanent stage set up in downtown Portsmouth, they call it pop up Portsmouth and and they have all kinds of different acts there. Um, I think they've got afternoon bands and evening bands or afternoon acts and evening acts. And they, they sell tickets for the tables that are there. The tables, I mean, talk about they, you know, you're supposed to be what six feet apart. These tables are like 16 feet apart. I mean, it's, Good. yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, when I got there and I saw it, I was like, Oh, okay. Like they, they really kind of, they went over, you know, quote unquote overboard, which to me is okay. Like, like I keep saying, if we look back on all of this and say, wow, I really overreacted to me, that's a win. So, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that was fine. Stage was big and I get there and I thought it was going to be a sound engineer that I've worked with many times before. And I was, you know, I walk into the gig thinking, okay, this will be great. I'll see Davis and, and we'll say hi to each other. And it, I won't have to do that. You know, that, that negotiation that you have to do the first time you meet a sound engineer, uh, I wouldn't have to do because he knows me, he trusts me, I trust him. He's going to let me use my in-ears and mix my ears by myself and, you know, all those things that I need. So I get there and I don't see Davis. I see uh, this woman kind of setting things up and she introduces herself. Her name is Francesca. And, and uh, she's like, yeah, I'm running your sound for tonight. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the normal engineer here. And I'm like, okay, right. Got it. Like, okay. And you know, it was that th there's that negotiation that you have to go through. And really it's, it, it's a negotiation about quickly building trust with each other. Right. And thankfully we were the first ones there and uh, Skylar and I were the first ones of the band there. And, uh, and so she's like, you know, they didn't send me a stage plot. And I'm like, oh yeah, let me tell you how it's all going to be. You know, who, how, what the gig is like, how many instruments you have, what that's all going to look like. And she was very thankful to get that. And of course, I know that as I'm giving her this information, A, I, I truly want to be helpful, but B, I also want to show her that she can trust me because with the board that I know they're using, because they're using Davis's board, it's an Allen and Heath board. He has it set up that if I want to mix my ears with the iPad, they have to give me admin access to the board. And that means I could, even as a mistake in the middle of the gig, adjust the mains, which is, you know, something that you have to be careful when who you give that control to, you know, <laughs> not preferable. Yeah. It's not preferable. So, so as I'm, as I'm talking with her, I'm thinking this through in my head, like I, I need to show her that, that I'm responsible, but telling her Davis would let me do it is probably not going to win me any points here. So I, 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 I chose not to ever play that card. Um, and was just telling her, okay, we're going to do this. And, you know, kind of saying, you know, this guy will run, uh, this guitar player is running a helix. So he'll go DI and this, that, and the other thing, you know, talking it through, like I would set it up. And she's like, oh, wow, that's really helpful. Thank you. You know, and, um, she didn't expect the drummer to show up and, and be able to tell her what the <laughs> list of inputs was going to, you know, potentially be. So she was really thankful. And it, again, it was that, you know, you have, you have to, I find it's way better if you go through this process and, and, you know, try and build that trust up front. And so then, you know, we're moving stuff to the stage and I'm like, Hey, there's a, you know, drum wedge there. Is it okay if I use any or she's like, absolutely. She's like, I can get you a feed. I'm like, great. XLR or quarter inch. I don't care what you send, you know, give me, I can, I'll take it from there. Great. Okay. A couple more minutes goes by. Hey, am I going to be able to mix my ears by myself? You know, testing the waters, feeling things out, yeah. you know? And she's like, yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be okay. She's like, um, do, do you have the app already on your iPad? I'm like, yep, I keep them all on my iPad, which another tip for everybody. If you're, if you're doing gigs like this, find every app for every mixer known to man and load them on your device and keep them up to date because it's the only way that you're guaranteed to be able to show up at a gig and be able to do this because you might not be able to get a Wi-Fi signal to download a new app and all of that, you know. And so she's like, oh, you already have it? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Which, which one is it? You know, and she's like, oh, it's QPad. I'm like, yep, I got it. Here we go. And um, 
and then, you know, and then she logged me into the Wi-Fi and everything was fine. And, and the gig went great, but, um, but you know, it's that, it's that negotiation of, like I said, just building trust up, up front that, that, and she was, ah, man, I mean, she had a tough job. She had a different singer for every song trying to blend everything. She was also the one running lights. Um, and she did a bang up job. I mean, the, the sound, you know, I mean, I mixed my own sound. So like, she, you know, she, she doesn't get blamed for any problems I had. Um, right. that's my own fault, but, but, um, like out front, you know, everybody said it sounded great. I, I saw some of the videos of it and it sounded great. It's cool. The one thing that, and this happens and I, I would love our, our pro sound engineer listeners to help me with this because we wound up doing, there were a bunch of tunes that Dave, the one of the, the guitar player and I wound up singing harmonies on. And then we actually, we did a, we did a Beatles tune together. We did, you can't do that. And he sang Johnny be good and stuff. So, was, I mean, we had some fun, but we were singing harmonies. And after one tune, I, we played uh, take it easy. You know, somebody else sang it and Dave and I are singing harmonies. I'm like, wait a minute, Dave's Dave can't hear what I'm doing. Uh, you know, it's obvious to me that he's not reacting to what I'm doing. So I, I had to assume that he couldn't hear me and I just, you know, went around him and everything worked out fine. And, uh, at the end of the set, I grabbed my iPad and, and looked at his monitor mix and it had none of my vocal in it or really any of the other vocals. It was just him. And I looked at all the monitors and I was like, that's how it is. And, and so I fixed it. And then at set break, Dave came up to me. He's like, I'm really sorry about taking it easy. I'm like, no, I know what the problem was. I'm like, it's fixed now. He's like, oh, thanks. Great. I, I, I need to hear you. I'm like, yeah, I know. And, um, <laughs> and, and, but this happens, I, I should have, I should have thought about this. I had a lot going on obviously. So I, that's why I didn't, but, but this is not the first time this has happened where the default mix of everybody's monitors in terms of vocals is themselves only and right. not the other harmony singers. And to me, as a, as a musician, I, like there's no part of, I don't understand why a musician wouldn't want all the vocals in there so you can hear and blend and all of that stuff. Now, I mean, obviously I'm looking at it through my own lens. Maybe there are plenty of musicians that don't want to hear everybody else on stage, but it just seems weird to me that that would be the default, but it is the default. So well, often. I, here's what I think it yeah. is, is that you, yeah. you can hear enough of the lead through the mains mm. and the thing you're always fighting is to be able to hear yourself comfortably and clearly. And you know, so many, so many monitor mixes are muddy yeah, fair. Your stuff gets lost. You're just you're fighting for survival in so many places. The essential <laughs> thing is to hear yourself. I, I guess but I that's think that's true. pretty accurate. I mean, I, yeah. like I like great monitor mixes, especially when it's somebody else, is a risk, right? And oh, so, totally, it's impossible. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So th that's what I think it is. You you can hear enough of pitch through the mains of a lead vocal line that it, that you can then kind of in your brain assimilate what yeah. you're hearing through the with what you're hearing through the monitor. Yeah, but you're not having, you're not starting with a fight happening in your monitor because you can always ask for it. Like, whoa, I need to hear some more of that. Okay, great. I'll give you that. That's easy to start from zero and go up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I bet. Yeah, okay. That makes, that makes good sense to me. Yeah. For in ears, I mean, again, I, you know, you never, like, she actually was telling me, she's like, oh yeah, I spent some time on the road where I've mixed in ears for people. She's like, but you know, that's different. She said, because I'm, I'm wearing ears, hearing their mix. Usually I try to wear the same brand and model as the artist so that I'm truly hearing as close to the same mix wow. as they're, it's what they're getting. I'm like, oh, okay, like sh this person knows what they're doing. Like, this is great. <laughs> She's like, but yeah. obviously tonight you're just going to be on your own. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you got enough to worry about. Like <laughs> I'm all good. <laughs> Um, so, so I, you know, I, without thinking about it, I, you know, I did my normal kind of thing where I give everybody all the vocals at one spot. And then I usually, you know, add two DB to me or something so that I can hear myself above everybody in my ears. But depending on it, sometimes I, I really like an ears mix that to me sounds flat. Sometimes it does mean that I have to give a little extra myself in, but, um, but I like to hear, I like to hear the whole blend, but yep. But that's a that's a that's a difficult thing to chase in a one off scenario. So correct. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. All right. I, I'm, I'm with you. Thank you. All right. He answered my question. Well, yeah, and, you know, I wonder with the with the cool tools that have come out and, you know, the ability for people to mix themselves. I wonder how many of the our listeners um, would agree with that, that, you know, monitors are, are a are a battle of survival. So you're just, just trying to get something that you can you can hear yourself 
especially singing, versus how many people always have a really good monitor mix? I mean, I know we have certainly a lot of semi-pro and professional you know, bands that, uh, you know, they have sound men and they get exactly what they want. Yeah, but I right. wonder for the weekend warrior people where, you know, literally it's just like, a, if I can get a little crutch out of this so I can hear myself better and, you know, ensure I'm not off key. I wonder how many people are like great sound versus survival mode sound. Yeah. I, I mean, I certainly know what you're talking about. So, so to, to, to follow it up, uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Let us know. Cause we, we definitely, this is an important conversation to have. Um, I certainly know what you mean about survival mode. I mean, being a drummer, I even a singing drummer, uh, you know, I started out for years without ever having a monitor behind anywhere near me. You know, it was like there's that wedge up at the front of the stage and that's what I get. So right. so when people say, wow, you really learned how to project. It's like, yeah, well, yeah, uh, I needed to hear myself. So, you know, that's how you do it. But um, I remember my brother had a. Um, uh, at one of those little gorilla practice amps, you know, they were, they were like these orange things th 30, 40 years ago, whatever it was. And, yep. uh, and he wasn't using it anymore. I'm like, dude, can I use that as a monitor? And he's like, <laughs> sure. And I, you know, I set it up next to me and it was like, oh, the heavens opened up. I was like, look, there's a speaker there. And, and the, the, the sounds I want come right out of it. It's amazing. Um, but even that, you know, compared to what we could do today was total survival mode. So I'm hoping nobody's, like routinely experiencing survival mode, but because uh, I feel like there's like this, this is an easily solved problem. And, and to be fair, like everyone loved how their monitors sounded the other night. Like it, they were great. Like everybody, even, you know, a guitar player was like, I can't hear you because, you know, I was at zero in his monitor. So of course he couldn't hear me, but he's like, you know, the mix is like the, the, the tone of the monitor is great. It's, you know, it's uh, like all of it was good. The tech is there now to, to, you know, ring things out and make it so that you really can get whatever mix you want, especially outdoors where you're not fighting reflections. And, uh, Have you ever played in a situation where all onstage instruments are going direct? Like you're the only sound on the stage? Um, yeah, I've gotten really close to, I think I have actually. Yeah. Maybe not like bass, which seems weird to be the one that would you would use an amp. Um, but maybe not bass. At, at, I've played with bass players that have gone direct, but I'm trying to think if I've ever played I, and I've played with bands where the guitar players and certainly keys have gone direct. I don't know if I've ever done all, but I've definitely done a gig where the bass player was the only amped instrument on the stage. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You know, it's interesting because um, cover band artists are getting a little older. There's such an influx of people who, you know, are weekend warrior dad bands, and, sure. you know, right. And they're more sensitive to volume often. And, mm -hmm. and the technology is getting really good. Head rush, Kemper. I mean, all these, you know, modeling, you know, technologies where you can go right to the, to the PA and, you know, sound great. Um, that technology is getting really good. And I, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to watch, but rock and roll just feels so good, you know, <laughs> playing into the air. Right. So I, you know, I, that's the one thing for me that every time I've tried to go direct like that, it just, you're, the tactile experience of strumming the strings and not feeling <laughs> something yeah. is just still off-putting to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I remember it, it, this is why I know that I've done this gig where the bass player was the only one live and everyone was on ears. So there was one point where, you know, my mix wasn't quite right. And it was like, okay, between songs, I'm going to fix it. But right now I'm just going to yank an ear out so that I can, you know, get through this tune, you know, it's survival mode, 2020 style, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course I pulled my ear out and it was like, oh, big mistake. Like I got <laughs> nothing now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I got to find a way because pulling an ear out with a drumstick in my hand is super easy. I can do that between beats. Putting it back in is not quite as easy a maneuver. I mean, I'm pretty good right. at it, but you know, the it's screwing in process is, takes a second. It takes a second. It's like, Oh crap. Like I got to get this back in right away. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was, I'm going to play a couple of beats with one hand uh, between the hi hat and the snare so that I can, I can pop this thing back in. So yeah, it, it, um, it is weird when, you, especially when you have in ears and you're used to, you know, you get used to that and then, you, but you know that there's sound around you. Um, and then suddenly, oh, there's not sound around me. I mean, even with in ears, not having the sound around me is, is a different thing for sure. You know, I mean, it, 
it, and I experience that in the studio, of course, when I play on my own, if I'm playing along on headphones or whatever, there's not the sound of, you know, the, the feel of a band being, being amplified around me somewhere, you, you yeah. know, it, it's, it, it is a more sterile thing. Again, I'm pretty used to it. And if I'm playing acoustic drums, then there is at least that, you know, but, but even that, like, depending on how the construction of the, the platform or the stage the drums can can really go away if you if you're playing on like concrete or something where there's no resonance underneath you you don't like i don't feel the kick drum at all it you know it just doesn't go there's no there's no resonance it doesn't come back so it, mm -hmm. it is a it is a very different thing um every environment so i don't know just how it goes but yeah yeah Hey, I wanted to tell you about something. Um, yeah, man. So I, one of the reasons we moved down here is that my wife and I have li these lifelong best friends that we love so much. And, you know, we vacation with them for years. And, you know, they they are our, kind of our ride or die that we hang out with. And uh, my friend, Mel, is a, is a teacher. And he's getting to the end of his teaching career. And, you know, he wants to keep busy with things. And so amongst other cool things that he does... Um, you know, he, he's built a wine cellar and he's, mm. you know, done, done all sorts of cool things. He's decided to take up drumming, right? Nice. So actually, first he tried to take up guitar and he found guitar, you know, kind of frustrating. So he, he then took up drumming and he's been at it about a year. He works like he's that type of guy who just works really hard, right? Yeah. So he, he, you know, at least is drumming an hour a day and um, he's really insistent upon the format of his of his lessons and was picky about his teacher and, you know, sure. you know, he knows where he wants to go. He wants to play. So having moved down there, I've been going up a couple of times and just kind of sitting in with them. And I'll say this, it's really fun again to rediscover when someone loves it so much, you know, when someone is enjoying it that much, it's really kind of fun to go back. And again, you know, all he wants to do at this point in time is get good enough to play a backyard barbecue, right. you know, for friends and family. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, so this was basically, other... I mean, and this is an incorrect assessment, but th this is, th there were elements of, of this in fling when I joined fling, whatever, you know, 14, 15 years ago, whatever. But then you got good, right? <laughs> <And> then <laughs> everybody, you you had something. everybody got yeah. comfortable with it. Yeah. I mean, so we, you know, there were various members that had had various levels of, ex of expertise, but there were a couple of people that were just like, you know, in that mode of life where they had played for a while, but never seriously. And it, now it was like, okay, now I want to figure out what it takes to be the, the next level. Like let's do a backyard barbecue. Okay. You know, once you do five or six of those, like, all right now, yes. right. You know, like, so fling went through that progression. And, and after we went through it, the guys said, a few of the guys said to the other few of the guys, like, thanks for being patient with us through all that. Like, it was like, no, <laughs> to, to your point, like it's infectious. It's those backyard barbecue gigs are fun and you can get to be a jaded old fart, you know, right. And be like, no, I only want to play gigs where there's a, you know, dedicated monitor engineer and a lighting engineer green room. And roadies <laughs> and a green room. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. It's like, you know what? It's fun when there's a freaking burger and a beer and, and you're set up in the grass and you just play for the love of playing. Yeah, it is. Exactly. And again, Mel's starting kind of from scratch. And so he works his butt off because, you know, he's he's been a competitive athlete his whole life and he's not going to be let himself be the weak link of this uh, type of thing. So that's good. Worked, yeah. Yeah. And he's gotten really far and he gets better every time I see him. And, uh, you know, the whole point of the story is it's just uh, a if anyone's listening out there that is thinking that they'd like to get back into it or pick it up. You know, I know we have a lot of people here who are who are more music fans than they are musicians who listen to us because they like the inside baseball aspect of it. It's never too late. And uh, if you approach it, you know, work hard, you know, you can, the great thing about rock and roll, especially, you know, it's harder, you know, it's a little harder with jazz, a little harder with other types of music. That's more, you know, more produced type of music, but to just grip it and rip it, play those type of songs, you can get there after a while. I mean, you know, yeah. be careful about the songs you choose, but, um, you can get there. And it, it, it is still the, the point about your flink story and my story, my buddy, it is one of the most infectious things you can do. It is just one of the most fulfilling things you can do. It gets inside you. It takes you over. You can't wait to do it again. That's the thing. I mean, is it, you can't it is wait still to do that it again. joy. Yep. I, I was shocked at myself and actually it wasn't just me, like my family at the time, my kids even, and they were relatively young. Certainly Lisa, it's like, you're going to a band rehearsal every week. Like this has been going on for a couple of months. 
what's going on here? Like, you know, she, like she wasn't suspicious or of, of me or anything, but you know, she was like, this isn't normal for you. You don't usually, you're not usually willing to rehearse. Like you, this band doesn't even have gigs yet. What are you guys doing? I'm like, you know, they're, they're just, they're, ha we're having fun. It's, it's bowling night, you know, and we had just, it's very similar to you. We, you know, we had just moved here. I met these guys and it was like, I need to meet some locals. And so this was bowling night. It's just, we didn't want to go bowling. We wanted to play music, but it was, it was just for the fun of it. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, as we're, this, and I'm, uh, this is a great conversation to have as we're, as we're having this, I'm thinking, you know, there aren't a lot of even, I mean, I, I've been amazing. It, my good fortune is not lost on me. I mean, there were many moments the other night where I had tears in my eyes, just Ooh. knowing how lucky I am to be able to do this and rock out like this because, you know, I mean, we, we went a few months here without knowing when the next time would be. And I also know that any of these times could be the last time, right? I mean, it's, we're, you know, we're at this weird precipice, but I've been really fortunate, but even these gigs are few and far between and very carefully selected. Um, I'm certainly turning down more gigs than I would, than, than some other people are around here. I'm just, you know, I'm really being cautious about it and I won't take a gig if everybody involved isn't being tested. Um, you know, and I realize that might be overreacting and I'm okay with it. Um, and I hope I don't uh, offend anybody permanently because of that, but I, it might, that might wind up happening to be perfectly honest, but that's okay. Um, but, uh, as I'm thinking about this and I'm looking at, you know, the spring and next summer, I'm not convinced we'll be where we would want to be with this hundred percent behind us. I agree. You, you know? And so the idea of these backyard barbecues and everything that, you know, I mean, if somebody, if somebody two years ago said to you, Hey, you know, we're, we're, um, we're playing, you know, we're having a, a, a cookout, you know, the neighborhood's coming over. If you guys want to come and set up and play, we'd love to have you, you know, you would have said F you like, no way. But like now may, maybe those are our gig opportunities. Um, maybe it comes down to the, for the love of playing, uh, I don't want to do any free yeah. gigs for any clubs or anything Necess yeah. you know, like, like if there's money being made, I, then, then we need to have the conversation about everybody participating in, in that equally or appropriately, not necessarily equally, but appropriately. But if it's, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to play and your neighbors are having a barbecue and they want a band and everybody's into it, you know, you don't have to go and play four sets at your neighbor's barbecue. You can go play one. That's okay. <laughs> you know, you don't have to yeah. kill yourself for this. Enjoy the beer, enjoy the burger, enjoy playing, but make that a part of it. Maybe, maybe that's what we are able to do next year is, is more backyard barbecues. And that's, you know, they're really well, I agree fun. With you. It, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with you. It, it seems like every day we wake up, I mean, I don't know exactly know what, what are we doing? Are we waiting for a vaccine? Are we waiting for herd mentality? Are we waiting for the thing to go away in the air? You see more and more people are just like, in the absence of a strong message, you know, what happens is those who are inclined to disagree with the localized messages are just going to disagree with the localized messages. That's it. We're just floating out there. It feels like now. And I don't know that that changes anything. No. Uh, yeah, time, yeah. Time, time in and of itself is not the answer here. It doesn't heal this particular wound to, to borrow the, the analogy, but um, yeah, we either need like an effective vaccine or, or, you know, I, I would I would love that, but I'm not banking on that because it doesn't exist. You know, I know Pfizer's close. I know several, you know, manufacturers in, in a variety of countries are close, but one hasn't been proven out yet. And until it is, I'm I'm not putting my stock in that particular pot. But um, yep. but the idea of ubiquitous testing, you know, I'm looking at what. Again, you know, I, I do lead a charmed life, Paul. Both of my kids are at schools where they're able to do uh, test the entire student bodies twice every week. And um, and it's working out fairly well for them. Um, it you know, it as it would always be anywhere. It's up to the students to decide if they want to as a body be responsible or not. And, and that will be the the ultimate decision maker there. But it is nice that that's the ultimate decision maker as opposed to just, well, the circumstances are that no one could possibly know if they're infected. So how can we, you know, what, what do we do? And, and, um, but you know, if, if we could get, if we could get everybody tested 
even once a week, like I, I think it would, a, it would provide us with the, the information that is somewhat valuable. You know, I mean, it gets less valuable. You know, you take your test and two, three days goes by. Well, okay. What have you been doing for those two or three days? How valuable is your test result from a week ago? You know, that kind of thing, but it gets it in the mindset. Like, okay, we're being proactive about this. We're being careful about this. I'm now being thoughtful about the things that I'm doing because, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of that, which is monitored is managed. Right. And, um, and that certainly works in business. And I think it would work here too. If everybody was just, just on a regimen of where it's sort of top of mind, like, oh yeah, we're being tested. I, I think if we did that, we could be having backyard barbecues next summer, uh, without in the absence of a vaccine. I don't know that we're getting people together for like, you know, concerts and, you know, full stadium packed sporting events. Well, I think those instant like tests is really the best that we can hope for right now. Right? That, like, if know. we could get instant tests, that, that would be a game changer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it before you go do something, spit on something you yeah. know, plus or minus and plus or minus you know, and go. good to go or not. Yeah. Right. And but, even but, if that's not a hundred percent perfect, because let's face it, nothing could possibly be a hundred percent perfect. Even if it's, you know, 90 plus percent, that's going to, I mean, it's going to really bring down the risk factor and the exposure factor. Uh, again, as long as everybody chooses to be responsible with the information that they have, right? Well, I'll just, I'll just offer this to you. I, I don't know that that's actually right. And here's why. So I have a friend sure. who um, has a gym uh -huh. and they can open and they can comfortably handle at the allotted allocation of percentage of square foot. Sure. Quite a few people. Yep. He's saying people are too scared to come. Like, you know, there's so yes. much fear out there. Yes. The test will help. The test, the test will help will probably, overcome that The test fear. will help with people you know. I don't Correct. think the test will help if you don't, you know, if you don't trust other people are being honest about the test because you don't know them. I don't know that it will help that. So I don't know if I agree with the economy either. back and I don't yeah. you know that type of thing. Yeah. No, it is. Hey, it's, one more thing. It's trust, right? And I will say this, you know, part of the reason that, that I have my, my policy about it, just everybody on stage has a recent negative test is because of you folks. Like I've, I've been keeping count. I've heard now from six of you from er various areas of the country who have said some version of the story, you know, my bandmates and I all trusted each other, trust each other. We've known each other for 10 years. We still trust each other. Uh, we decided to play a gig. We didn't need to get tested because we all trust each other. And, you know, a week after the gig, you know, half of us or more came down with COVID and somebody came to the gig with it. Didn't, you know, one of the bandmates brought it to the gig and didn't know. And, and like I said, there have been six of those stories that you have shared personally directly yeah. with me. I've seen other versions of that story on all the Facebook message boards and all that stuff. Trust, like you just said, Paul, is about believing someone when they say they've taken the test and believing yeah. someone when they tell you. And since the test, yes, I went to the grocery store, but other, but I wore a mask and, you know, I, I didn't encounter anybody where I felt was risky. Like that's where trust matters is believing the person when they tell you these things. It's not, you can't. I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm certain I don't have COVID. There's zero reason you should trust me with that unless I back it up with some, some data yep. to show you why, right? Like, Which is what they do in, in China, right? They yeah. have the whole thing where you have the green, you know, stripe yeah. on your phone or, you know, yeah. and you have to show that or not. Right. That's what my daughter has at her school. Actually, my son and daughter have that at their school. They, they get a, a day pass on their phone every day that says yay yeah, or nay. Yep. Yeah. Hey, before we go today, can we do one thing for the good of humanity? Yeah, man. Let's do it. I cannot look at social media anymore I know. without people showing that Facebook thing saying Facebook's going to cut off your, your live streams and take your band page down and all that type of stuff. For our listeners and for just, again, because we're good guys and we just want to do our part to save humanity, can you please <laughs> explain to our listeners the definitive perspective on Facebook is not going to stop your streams? Right. So that's the that if, if you want to just stop the podcast now, <laughs> wait 10 more seconds. Facebook has not changed anything about allowing you to do your live streams. OK, now. I actually, I think you should probably not live stream on Facebook anymore anyway, but, and I will share why in a minute, but, but as to that first part, the clause that everyone has found has remained unchanged since 2018. Someone NME checked with Facebook 
uh, and wrote an article about it. Uh, Steve over at Cover Band Central wrote a piece based on the NME piece. You found something from, oh, it's at the top of my head that you posted to our- Well, Jay Gap Segan Gap. posted Jay something, Segan. but it was, a, that's right. it was a guy from CD Baby who yeah. actually wrote the- Right. right. That's right. It was CD Baby. So they, they, they contacted Facebook. So there's been several people that have contacted Facebook about this. Facebook, it does have an update to their terms of service coming October 1st. It is based upon the, the catalyst for it is a lot of political stuff that they wanted to get under control um, in reading through the new full version of the terms of service. Some people saw this and thought it was new. It's not. Facebook is not interested in shutting down the streams in the way that you've already been doing them. Um, they, they have had some rules in place about streaming for a while. Uh, you can't just go and stream other people's music. As you, and that's actually the big part of it, right? They yeah. don't want other people's. You know, what I was reading, they don't want you to put up like a a slideshow with pre recorded you know, music, right? That, that's the stuff that they're tra- that they're cracking down. That's on. the stuff, and that, I can and, say firsthand, and that's the stuff they should tra- crack down totally. on. Totally. Um, I know when I do my streams, I have been doing pre recorded walk in music basically before I start playing. Yeah. And what I try to do is acoustic um, covers of other songs that I was thinking might not get caught, you know, through the Facebook algorithm to know that it's a good cover. luck. But they, they've caught it. Yeah. Every time. Much, so I won't yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, eight yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. Eight, eight out of 10. Yeah. 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 It, YouTube does the same thing. They, they just don't want you taking, you know, little feats waiting for Columbus and playing that as your Facebook stream audio, you know, right. go, go and play your own version of fat man in the bathtub and everything's okay. Um, so now here's the thing though. I don't think for most of us, and I think you need to look at your own data and decide this thinking about the platform in general and kind of zooming out a little bit. I think Facebook is the wrong place for most of us to stream our music. Now I get why so many of us, especially those of us of, you know, our demographic, Paul, are choosing to make that, you know, kind of the obvious choice because it's where we hang out, right? It's where it's, it's the social media platform that, that we are on. Uh, it, you know, it's one of them anyway. And, and, you know, and it's like, it it's, that's where my friends are. I want to stream my music to my friends. To me, Facebook is not built for that, right? Facebook, you just scroll through. It's for driving by things and and reading little snippets and spending maybe a minute and a half on something and then you sort of keep moving. Facebook is a scrolling platform. YouTube is a sit and watch platform. Twitch is a sit and watch someone stream something for a very long period of time platform. So if you look at your, I, I encourage everybody to stream to all three of those platforms, Facebook, YouTube. Which you can do pretty easily now. Yeah, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And then go look at your metrics because I think what you'll find, many of us will find, not everybody, there's certainly going to be exceptions to this. But I think what many of us will find is that Facebook is full of really high view counts because you're showing up in people's feeds and you're there, you know, scrolling on by and maybe stopping for 10 seconds. But, but that's it is it's full of drive-bys and then they keep moving. The analogy in my head is I've got this great sports bar where I love to go and have a beer and chat with my friends. And I, and I like to go there all the time. Not so much that it's a problem, but you know, just like, let's take that out of it. Okay. So I'm at this sports bar. It's my favorite place to go. Now I want to go play music. So I convince the people at the sports bar to let me set up in the corner and everybody hates it. Why? Because it's a sports bar. There's no music being played there. People aren't there for the music. They're there for the conversation. That's where my friends are. But my mm-hmm. friends aren't there to hear music. You know, maybe I convince them that they want to, mm. you know, that, right. But but for the most part, the people like that place has built a clientele of folks that are there to chit chat with each other and maybe debate politics and, you know, talk about their lives. Whereas the rock club down the street where I never go and hang out with my friends has rock bands every night. And maybe even though. I don't know anybody in there. That's a better venue for my band and the rock so club. I love this. I love this analogy. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm gonna. I'll, we're all just about out of time, but I think mm. we need to do more of this. And so here, here's what I'm thinking. Um, having thought about this um, and watching the conversations that are going on, so a lot of f Facebook and you know, a lot oh, of sure, of stuff. course, yeah. And actually, one of my one of my responses is 
Facebook doesn't owe you anything, right? I, I mean, <laughs> just remember what to. you paid for the ticket, folks. Yep, exactly. So that that would be one part of it. There's no cover had, charge at the sports bar. <laughs> I had one good friend say, "Well, this is where my friends are. I'm not trying to be world famous. I just want to be local famous, and my local friends are here. So that's one perspective. Um, boy, Twitch, they won't like me. You know, I'm, I play you know '70s stuff. Those are all kind of young gamers. So I don't think the Twitch audience is there. YouTube seems to have some hold." But the only the only issue is, um, but my people are here, yeah. right? My people are on Facebook, so so that that's where people are kind of stuck. Yeah, I, I, I we wound up we were streaming the bitter pill shows to Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and and Twitch we got a great response out of. I mean, it really made made sense. Bitter pills music is uh, like I would not. I mean, it's, it's weird, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into like a genre of like classic rock or something like that, you know, but, um, but it, you know, it, there are people there and the good news about Twitch is like I said, people go there to watch what other people are doing in real time for a long time. You know, yes, Mm -hmm. a big part of what, what Twitch's foundational platform is, is people watching other people play video games. And if you think that's weird, did you sit and watch any sports on TV this weekend? If so, it's literally the same thing that you're watching someone else play a game. Um, I've, I don't spend a lot of time on Twitch, but once I kind of put that analogy in my head, it was like, Oh yeah, actually this makes a lot of sense. Um, but there are, but it is a platform built for that. YouTube really isn't built for the streaming. Yes, of course you can do it. Yes. They have the live things, but really YouTube is about those six minute videos. Like that's what their search engine highlights for you. That's what Mm. they bring to the top. So yes, you can do this on YouTube, but discoverability wise, I think you're better off on Twitch, but, but you know, it's a good experiment, but I think we all need to open our minds a little and experiment with this and, and prove to ourselves, just make it a data database decision as opposed to a, you know, a, a, a theoretical decision. Maybe one of the things we could look for, because it doesn't have to be Twitch. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're using this analogy, if you want people who like music, there, I'm sure, and the, this started at the beginning of the pandemic, some people started to build out some kind of custom built streaming platforms yeah. for music things, right? Yeah. And along with that was the right type of outreach marketing and the right type of fan interaction. You know, like Facebook's fan interaction is kind of, clumsy, right? You know, you kind of got to stop what you're doing, see who's online, you know, acknowledge them. So, you know, there's no reason it has to be Twitch or YouTube other than the fact that they've got millions of users already. But if, if that, if we believe that analogy that millions of users aren't that helpful, I mean, by numbers, it, it you know, you're bound to find some people who are going to be interested in you. But if you really want to start drilling down, get away from the people who are the gamers on Twitch and the, and the, um, and the, uh, you know, cat videos on, on, uh, on YouTube and, and, uh, you know, get to a place where music fans hang out. I'm sure that there are options for music specific streaming platforms, uh, that musicians should, but you have to be, you have to have enough courage to encourage your, yeah. your yeah, you got to build your, an audience. Yeah, your, yeah, exactly. Encourage your Facebook fans or wherever you are to follow you over there because there's some compelling reason to do it and it has to work and it has to be seamless and you know, all that type of stuff. Yeah. Good conversation to have because like you said, we may be going into next year still in a, in a very similar place where we are. And so the uh, state of the art of streaming will continue to evolve. And, yeah. Know, so, yeah. I mean, right. what, one thing I will point, well, uh, two things I'll point out. Number one, I, I'll put a link in the show notes for a, a great place to start as a musician for Twitch, they have a whole set of their, their knowledge Ooh. base built for musicians. So I put that link in the show notes already, but let me just put this thought into your mind. You could stream to Facebook, you could stream to YouTube, you could stream to Twitch, and there's lots of other places you could stream, but those are the three we've been talking about. Only two of them make apps for your television. Facebook ain't one of them. Mm. So think about this, like which platforms are ones that are geared towards having people watch video content. That's such an interesting concept. So just think about this. You got to, you know, we all need to zoom out. This only hit me as we were talking about it here. It's like, wait a minute, you know, like I can't watch Facebook on my TV easily. I can easily watch Twitch. They've got an app, YouTube, no problem. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And we say always be performing and uh, you know, music is a, 
music is a visual experience as we've been also saying quite a bit. And so, you know, yeah. maybe we need to put a different lens on it. I know, <laughs> you know, I play my, playing my heart out for somebody that is watching me in a three and a half inch screen <laughs> is, you know, <laughs> I'll take it, but, uh, I'm reminded of David Byrne when, uh, sorry, uh, not David Byrne, David Lynch, when, when he first saw a video, you know, iPod, or maybe it was a phone, but I think it was a video iPod. And somebody was like, isn't this amazing? You can watch movies on this. He's like, look how small it is. This is terrible. This is going to ruin everything. <laughs> you know, this is the death of art as we know it, you know, and, and yeah. he just went into this rant, this tirade, but he, you know, he wasn't wrong. So, yeah. Well, he doesn't put llamas in every third scene for no reason. I mean, they're there for you to discover. That's You're right. not going to find them on a three-inch screen. That's right. I'm curious if anyone is using Ustream. Uh, I, I know, I know, I know uh, our podcasting friends in the tech world, the, the um, Twit people, Leo Laporte and his, his cohorts over there stream to, they stream to YouTube. They stream to Twitch. Of course they use Twitch as their main pl platform. And then they also stream to Ustream. So I'm wondering if anybody's out, out there has been, been experimenting with Ustream as a musician. Yeah, I mean, because the other side of it is, is the, is the, the reach part of it. Remember, you know, Facebook you is not your friend. You're creating content for them. They oh, yeah. play a lot of games with how you can invite people, your, your own people that you put effort into accumulating to get them to find out what, what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's this kind of labyrinth of a, of a difficult game. So yeah. if other platforms make it easier, and I, th I think all the things that you're saying are really, you know, it is a flyby type of medium. It is. Yes, you can stay in one place, but the, it's more about, you know, they want to give you those tools so they can keep their users I just saw this fascinating thing. My last thought for this. Sure. Um, on Netflix, The Social Dilemma. Oh, great movie. Oh, my God. Well, a documentary movie? A documentary, what yeah, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, and the basic premise is, is that, you know, it, they, they're interviewing all these kind of original social media engineers who are largely saying we had no idea it was going to go this poorly. I mean, we were just trying to make a cool thing that brought people together. We had no idea. And then there's one of the early you know, business guys, a business development guy for Google. He goes, Oh no, no, we, we had, we had total understanding what we were doing. We <laughs> knew, we knew that you get an endorphin hit when someone, you know, puts a like on your stuff and yeah. you're going to stay connected to us and watching us and stay focused on us. And the more we can keep you focused on us, the more we can sell ads, more we can learn about you. So we can sell more and more ads and how unhealthy this whole thing has become. And, you know, it kind of goes into how it has been a large catalyst in dividing people Oh, perspectives about the country. I mean, of you know, course, fun, fundamental to it. Right. Yep. Anyway, so it is, it's fundamental to it. You're right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it, if you watch it, you cannot help but thinking whether you want to opt into that anymore. You may say, and then the funny thing is over the credits of it, they have all these experts giving you like, they're almost like outtake reels of things you should be doing to protect yourself when you're on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like the throwaway stuff, which that should be the whole thing. Right. But, um, it's fascinating. And, and again, the thing is, is, you know, once you accept it, even though it's easy now after 10 years or 10 years plus on Facebook, where you have a lot of, you know, you've developed an audience, you have a page, you have followers, all that type of stuff, you know, they still want to charge you to get at your own followers. They got to make money too, but they're making money from you, the content creator to sell your con own content to your own yeah. fans. And they're selling that to advertisers as well. So it's, um, it's not a healthy relationship, I think in, in many, many, many ways. Oh, not, not so even, I don't, not in, I don't know if it's healthy in any way for us. I mean, you know, the ability to stay connected to people through our, you know, through the ether, I, I suppose there's some element of that that's healthy. Um, not all of it is though, you know, look at William Gibson and, 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 you know, the whole idea of cyberspace, right. Which, mm. which he conceived of after John Perry Barlow gave him ketamine once, like <laughs> literally are in, and, and then like the people creating the things that are the internet sort of went on Gibson's vision of cyberspace. So literally the world we're living in was conceived on ketamine. Thanks to Barlow. Um, crazy guy. Wonderful guy. <laughs> he never gave me ketamine, so I, I, I can't speak to, to that experience. But, um, but I do know that that's, that's how that happened with, with Gibson. Like, it, like, we are in this weirdly, even you and I having this conversation here, it, like, we're comfortable with this. But it is different than you and me being in the same room together having this conversation. Sure. Right? You know, sure. it's like, it, it, like, we do it. It's fine. I, in fact, I love it. 
but there is a, a, a sterility about it that that's not there when we're in the same room and you know we, even among we, people who are close to each other correct even amongst yes 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 thank you for making my point yeah yeah for clarifying my point yeah so yeah, yeah it's weird man yeah all right well that's what we got for this week that's what i got i don't know you got anything else man well you know once we're branching off into ketamine and john perry barlow and and uh and Neuromancer, I guess we're I guess we're officially o- that, over the shark. The, I m- two of my favorite evenings ever were the conversations I had with John Perry Barlow in the green room after two sequential Cirque du Mac gigs. The first one, I had no idea who this guy was. I was introduced. <laughs> I was introduced to two of the three co-founders of of. Um, of of the EFF, right? So Mitch Caper was not there. Gilmore was there, uh, and and then and then Barlow was there. But I was introduced to these two Johns. I didn't put things together in my head or anything. And and Gilmore was such a, uh, I mean, they were both real presences. But Gilmore was is such a crazy personality. I don't know if you've ever met John Gilmore, but you know he's massive. First one of the first Sun employees, uh, just like real crazy about like privacy and everything in a good way. Like a really great guy, but but very. He's a unique person like you, you will, he will take up a lot of the air in the room. And I just wound up sitting on the couch next to this other guy, John, and had this intense, like 90 minute, really in-depth conversation. And, and I saw our mutual friend, Andy Stone, the next day who had brought this cast of crazy people into the green room, bless his heart. And, uh, and, you know, I saw him the next day and he's like, wow, you, you and Barlow really hit it off last night. I'm like. Barlow, who's Barlow? <laughs> He's like, you're the guy you're talking to. I'm like, John? He's like, yeah, John. And I'm like, wait, that was John Perry Barlow? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, holy crap. <laughs> and then I saw him the next year. And of course we, we hit it off again. And I knew, obviously at that point, I knew who he was, but, but it, it was actually good to have a conversation like that with him without knowing who he was. Cause I, it didn't, you know, I like, didn't I didn't color the conversation. It didn't color the conversation. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. 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 We get it. I'm sure he appreciated it too, to be perfectly honest. It's really funny. You know, so what was it like writing throwing stones? Like, yeah, you know, I don't think he really care to answer that question you know <laughs> at, at 1 a.m someday somewhere but he probably would have at the time probably unfortunately we lost him uh too early but there you go all right well that was interesting so I, this episode we've had we've had some like this but this one certainly hits the vibe when you brought me the concept of doing gig gab and and i sort of kind of pitched it you know to myself and and as i've described it to other people it's like you know those stupid conversations you have in the green room after the gig that mm. no one really cares about except all the people that are there, you know, that are boring to the, the the general people, but musicians love where you're just obsessed about gear, how the gig went or anything. That's gig gab. So this episode, I feel like, really turned into Rep- that kind representative. of representative. Very <laughs> representative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm glad we recorded it. That was a good idea, man. Yep. I hope we recorded it. <laughs> You hit the red button, right? I, I see the red light on, so <laughs> yeah, so there you go. All right, let's uh we could do this all day. Thank you folks, thanks for listening. Let us know your thoughts, let us know on uh that sound stuff and what streaming platforms you're using, monitors, survival, or are you spoiled? We got so Ketamine. many things. Ketamine, uh, let us know. I don't know. Always be performing. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>